welcome everybody to our ISA Roundtable event, where we are talking all about feedback. I'm going to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for this event. First off, the Nickelodeon Writing Program. If you do not know about the Nickelodeon Writing Program, please go check it out. It is a year-long development program for television comedy writers with unique voices and from underrepresented communities. It is a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, another sponsor is Cinequest. They are currently um, open for submissions for their 18th Cinequest screenwriting competition. So make sure that you enter for that. Um, our next sponsor is NFMLA, which is the New Filmmakers Los Angeles. They are a wonderful program that showcases a monthly um, screenings of films. This month is the Latinx and Hispanic Cinema event. We are giving away one ticket for that on September 24th. And the way that you can win these prizes is go on Twitter and tweet about something that you learned today in this conversation and make sure to tag at Network ISA. We'll select a winner and um, let you know. We are going to get started. Um, again, we're here to talk about feedback. So um, I'm going to go around the panel of our ISA staffers. They are gonna tell you a little bit about who they are, what they do, and how their job relates to feedback and notes. We're gonna start with um, Mr. Max Tim. So yeah, my name is Max, and you've probably seen me on previous webinars. Uh, Shana and I host a, a fun news show called ISA Insider News on our YouTube channel. Um, please go and subscribe to that. It's completely free. And you'll notice that our YouTube channel is a wealth of free education. So just go and check it out. It's something easy and fun if you wanted to watch some, some videos in the morning. Um, but um, and you also find of, on the pro tips page, sorry. And on the pro tips page. <laughs> on the ISA inside. For sure. Yeah. Um, so as far as my job title, I mean, I'm, my job title is director of education. So I help create a lot of the coursework, a lot of the feedback um, uh, processes that, that really Jeff and his team has, have, have taken over over the years and improved upon, uh, you know, alarmingly well. <laughs> uh, I mean that in a good way. Um, but uh, I I give feedback constantly. It, it, it really is a, that's what I do every single day for, you know, eight plus hours a day, not only through my consulting where I'm working one-on-one -on -one with um, my story farm uh, writers, where I'm on calls and I'm giving them notes, but um, also by way of the projects that we have um, through the, not only the development slate, but the actual production slate that we're taking out to town, working with our agent, pitching. Um, so it's a, it's a constant mode of, of giving feedback with, you know, very specific notes, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. Um, next, we're going to go to Miss Jordan. Unmute yourself. Speak. <laughs> Speak. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jordan. I am the ISA's Development Department Creative Executive. Um, I give feedback now. I used to, you know, give feedback to everyone. Now my feedback is more along the lines of um, taking a script that is pretty much already there and getting it that extra little bump. So when it goes to a producer, an executive, a director, um, it, it aligns with what they're looking for or um, helps you take it, you know, from 100% to 110%. Uh, there, this is an industry that looks for reasons to say no rather than reasons to say yes. And so I try to help eliminate as many of those no's as I can um, along the way. The Jordan likes to call her feedback surgical where it's like, okay, we're not changing the whole thing because it's good, but you're like, putting things in it's like surgery like all right um next up we are going to go to sean hello sean oh you're muted unmute i've got to find my unmute <laughs> now it's definitely unmuted. it's definitely unmuted oh dear uh i'm sean i'm a story executive in the submissions department i work mostly with the writing gigs that people submit to i'm i go through those and i also work uh, with selected people from the gigs to take their script to the next level and take it someplace where we can make it producible. I, um, I know feedback from both sides of the table. I've been a writer and a producer. So I've, uh, I've uh, been hurt and I've hurt. So I try to be as gentle as possible and 
my whole thing is let the thing be what the thing is. The script is what it is, and it's not my job to rewrite it for the writer, but to help the writer make their voice come out. Great. And on to Jeffrey. Hello, everybody. I'm Jeffrey Morales, and I'm a story executive at the ISA, and I oversee our reading team. So any feedback that comes in through our regular channels, I assign it to a reader, as well as hiring and training that reader before that point. And after they complete their notes, I am the one that edits it and sends it out. So if you've gotten any feedback from the ISA in the past couple of years, you've actually gotten an email from me. And uh, I also do notes on my own, similar to Max, with a consultancy. And just recently, we've married that with the ISA to create the Accelerator, where Sean and I work together and provide notes directly for a writer, as well as meetings that happen alongside those notes to help you develop your project in sort of different ways from different opinions, because Sean and I have very different opinions when it comes to styles of scripts and things of that matter. Uh, and I also, uh, something that some people might not know is that whenever we see a script that is very strong, that comes through feedback, I keep a record of it and I make sure that other people on the team know about it. So everyone on the team is always trying to find different ways to promote projects and find new avenues for success for writers. And so we've been trying to work on that continuously on the feedback side. And so that's uh, that's my little area of the ISA. Excellent, thank you. And last but not least, Mr. Craig James, the man himself. Yeah, what do you do here, Craig? Yeah, she's, <laughs> I was sitting here thinking, like, Jesus Christ, I'm, I don't know, what do I say? Um, I don't have anything to do with the feedback. Actually, I'm, uh, I guess I'm here as a, uh, from the perspective of, uh, you know, what, do we, what can we do to encourage writers to get feedback? As a writer myself, I'm spending a lot of time getting feedback as of late and have learned a lot about receiving feedback and what to take in. And so hopefully I'll be able to contribute in that way today. Because um, it wasn't something that I did uh, initially when I first started writing. And over the last 10 years working with Max and getting notes back from Sean and Jeffrey and Jordan and even Shana, um, I've learned a lot. And so um, I feel like the craft is, my, my writing has gotten 10 times better from finally listening, you know, and uh, and taking in that information. So that's why I'm here today. Awesome. And I am Shana Weber. I am um, part of ISA. I do not provide feedback um, professionally, but I'm a writer. So I'm going to moderate this chat. And also I can throw in some insight from my own perspective of receiving feedback and what to do with that feedback you when it may not be something pitches. I do yeah. I give feedback I'm just saying not like I'm not a reader I don't professionally provide feedback right. because quite honestly I'm not that articulate <laughs> <laughs> to write it out like in a succinct way it's more like all over the place for me so anyway. I don't know Shana you had such a great comment that I've been using in my writing groups and and with my um one-on-one -on -one writers when we were recording our recent insider news when we were talking about the difference between Lord of the Rings and House of the Dragon I'm going way off on a tangent here but Shana said <laughs> it's like the comparison of Superman versus Batman and Superman is like Lord of the Rings where it's kind of bright colors and it's pretty and there's no real violence and it's all kind of feel good and then House of the Dragon is Batman and where it's dark and rigid and bloody and I was like nailed it so you're articulate Thanks. I wouldn't hold yourself back <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Um, all right, so we're gonna dive in here. If you guys have questions, thank you for those who put them in the chat. But as we're talking, if something pops into your brain and you wanna ask, put it in the Q&A box. And at the end of this um, conversation, we're gonna go to that and answer as many of those as we can that we haven't answered during this chat. Um, and speak in the chat, talk, you know, reply, all of that. We're gonna be watching that as we're talking. Um, and again, put your, whatever you learned, whatever comments you liked, anything like that on Twitter and tag at Network I say to enter for um, those prizes. Okay, so first of all, when we were discussing this conversation about feedback, Jeffrey had a wonderful um, message optimistic statement to give to writers just generally about feedback. So I think before we dive into those questions, Jeffrey, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the writer still having control of their script and, and empowering them versus feeling defeated. Right. So something that we all hold is true, not just on this team, but across the entire ISA, as well as our full reading team, 
is the belief that the writer should be the one in charge. The writer should have as much agency, particularly where a lot of our writers are in their development, in their creation of their material. And so when we talk about feedback and we talk about giving notes, we believe firmly that the writer is ultimately the one who knows best for their vision. So we tell the readers that, and so that when they provide notes, they're going to do their best to provide notes that help the writer realize their vision. Sometimes this can seem a little at odds if the notes are very harsh or asking a lot of questions, but that's all they are. They're suggestions and options that we're trying to provide for the writer. And so above all else, we want to focus on the writer's agency and making sure that the writer comes to our notes and then leaves with even more options than they had before. Excellent. Okay, so as we get started, we're going to start with the basics. Let's talk about what is feedback exactly? Um, when do you need feedback? So Max, what is feedback notes? Are there different types? <laughs> All of it, just go. Uh, yeah, it's a, a lot of different answers because Everything kind of depends on where you are in the draft. What type of feedback is it? Is it just verbal, you know, response? Is it written feedback? Is it feedback you're receiving from a long-term coach? There are a lot of different types, but all of it from a very basic level is some form of commentary or notes on the submitted project. That's base level, which I think everyone in, you know who's watching right now understands that. Um, I think the importance, I'm kind of jumping to somewhat of the next topic, but the importance comes from you as the writer understanding where you are in the process of not only that project, but also the type of feedback you're expecting, because there's contest feedback that could be from some contests, a paragraph versus in-depth five plus pages of notes. You have to adjust your head and brain a little differently per, because you kind of have to know what to expect from, from each. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll stop there just so I don't kind of take over because I could wax poetic on that for a while. All right, we'll come back to you then. Um, Jeffrey, since you are, um, you oversee our readers, can you talk about the different type from, at least from our perspective, what are the different types of feedback um, pertaining to where your project is? And like, when would you go for each specific type of feedback? So I would, I would group our feedback into essentially three categories. The first category would be the first 20 evaluations, the full evaluations, and our deep dives. Now, some people I find look at first 20 evaluations and they think, well, it's only the first 20 pages, it's a page of notes. Is that more of an entry level thing to maybe get an idea of how my notes are being, or my script is being received? And it can serve that purpose. But there's so much that you can do in the first 20 pages that de dedicating a full page to that is extraordinarily valuable. And in fact, you'll find as you progress in a writer, that can actually be some of the most valuable feedback just to get an immediate impression of how that opening is doing. So all of those different forms of feedback are something that a writer should consider as they're starting to work on their project, as they've moved through, say, the first, second draft. And they, the readers on our team have all been told quite often by me is that you need to figure out as best you can what the writer's vision is. And then your notes need to be focused on helping the writer realize that vision through the draft. And so you're going to find a similar approach across those three categories. After you've started to do that, then you can look at development evaluations. Now, development evaluations are a bit more challenging and they're going to be a bit more direct in terms of the expectations of the industry, how we expect scripts to be received by producers. And in particular, say, okay, well, we see where you're going with your style, but also we wanna talk about your structure a little bit more. And so that is another place where you can work up to that. Um, as we've gone on, we've started to develop more specialized evaluations. These are our market evalu evaluations, our craft evaluations. We have now the pitch evaluations, which again, you should have a very strong script and then you can go into the pitch with knowing what your vision is and talking with Shana, who will do a great job. And craft, uh, craft is done by Max which is fantastic. And then, as I mentioned, we have the accelerator with Sean and I. And so that is sort of the pipeline. And I would also recommend that we have these services within the ISA. We're always trying to find different resources, but also look towards writing groups, look outside the ISA, look towards representatives, look towards your friends, look towards other writers, because you want to have not just 
our feedback, but a diverse set of voices from all sorts of different angles. Okay. Well, that brings up a good topic that Sean, I'm going to go to you for. So, you know, there's people out there who are like, well, I'm not going to pay for feedback. I'm going to go to a friend or somebody who I know or somebody who's a producer. So can you talk a little bit about just feedback in general of like, should you, why should you pay for feedback from somebody who's a stranger who, whose job it is to do this versus going to people that you know, people that are in your writing group? Is there a balance that you should make or, you know, what's the point of paying for feedback? Yeah, I think there's a value to both of them, but I think my general opinion, and what you'll hear me say a lot to writers is if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. You know, nobody really has all the answers and anybody who says they do is just trying to take your money. So, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. But my personal opinion is that writers groups and your friends are really good for early on in the process. But as you get further and further along, you want to get somebody whose job it is to do this, somebody who has experience and not just anybody, but, you know, look at who the people are that are giving you advice. Um, I mean, I taught at a university level and I also, you know, worked professionally so i've got some background that doesn't mean i have all the answers but it means i have some of them and i'm not i'm sort of dispassionate about it even if it, i really am involved in the script and i really like it i'm still looking at it from a standpoint is this producible is this something saleable um your writers group tend to want to build each other up perhaps to a degree that's not healthy after a while where it's just everybody patting themselves, each other on the back. Whereas if you're coming to professionals like us, or there are other people out there, or a representative or managers, when I was a writer, managers, my managers provided feedback service. It was all trying to make the script better and make the script more saleable. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You know, there's a, oh, go sorry, ahead, Greg. Can I jump in there? Um, yep. There's a comment about, is this an ISA commercial for feedback? Um, it's a commercial for everybody to get feedback wherever you feel like safe getting it or comfortable getting it or where you connect 100% because even if you don't use our services, it's not about our services, it's about encouraging you to get feedback down. I'm, I'm an example of a, like avoiding getting feedback from anyone outside of my little safe space. And um, the notes that I've been getting back are all very positive and, hey, this is, you know, your story is, uh, that's really exciting. And my mom loved it. But, the, you know, going beyond all of that, the nuances of the feedback that we get, that you can get from readers, um, will change your script if you're willing to hear it. Because a lot of times, uh, to what Jeffrey and Sean are saying, is that the nuance of screen, uh, you know, when you're, when you're um, getting I just lost my train of thought. Um, you, you really want people uh, who don't really know your voice. This is one of the things that I've learned through mm -hmm. uh, submitting to other organizations because I too submit outside of our organization to get notes. I don't just go to our team. I want people to hear or to give me uh, notes without having a clue as to um, who I am, and they don't, they won't hear anything, they won't hear my voice in the words that are being, that are on the page. They won't see me in a main character, because we all write what we know, and if you're sending it to somebody that you know in a writer's group, they're going to hear you saying the words. Right. And so getting outside of, uh, getting notes from outside of that, I know it's an expensive proposition to invest in that, but it's something seriously worth considering. So as you can uh, develop your script from a place of um, an outside perspective of people that you do trust. Sorry, I'm kind of rambling, but. No, that's I great. I think, I, I think that the point being is that of course we can only talk about the feedback that we provide at ISA and it is not in, in ISA's world to talk about other people's feedback or say anything negative about anywhere else. We can only talk about what we know and what we can provide. So that is the context of that. But as Craig said, you can go wherever you want 
for feedback. Um, and you should, you should go to different sources for feedback because it's only going to help you in the end. Um, right. Max, I, I was going to, uh, yeah, can, Sean? Can, I, can I just one more thing? I'm sorry. Uh -huh. One thing that I've noticed because I've been in writers groups recently is that people tend to, but the local writers groups, they tend to want to rewrite your stuff for you. And if you're going outside of that, you're getting somebody, I mean, like we said, my way of looking at the script is let the thing be what the thing is. It's what I see that the writer wants in it. It's not what I would do with it. So be very sort of careful about that. And that's just from my experience. No, that was great. Cause that's sort of what my question was to Max is what is, what is good feedback versus bad feedback. And I think Sean just touched on that in terms of bad feedback is when somebody's telling you what they would do versus what is good feedback? What should you look for? What are some um, components of really good feedback that you should say, okay, yes, I'm going to listen to this person. I think a really easy thing to consider, and this is what I, I know Jeffrey um, works with all of our readers to, to take this approach, it's a vo vocabulary and word use is really important when when you're giving someone feedback. Um, like just as a basic example, words like the difference between should and could is huge when when you're receiving feedback from someone. Because if you have an outside you know source of any kind, whether it's literally your mom or it's just a consultant you hired. And that person is continually saying, you should do this, you need to do that. It, it completely changes the mindset of the person accepting the notes. And so try to pay attention to that when you receive notes and then don't, don't react so immediately defensive. Mm -hmm. That person who's giving those notes just may not be coming from that place. And, and they, as far as having some amount of empathy, <laughs> Um, so when we try to give notes, it's, you could, here's a suggestion here. We could do this as opposed to you need to do that. Um, and suddenly it feels a little bit more like, I don't know, there's a camaraderie there. Um, that's one thing, pay attention to the word usage, um, of some of the notes that you're receiving, whether it's verbal in a writing group or if it's written. Um, I think, you know, it, it's, it is too bad that sometimes you, re, you hear stories of writers receiving notes and they're like, it doesn't even seem like they read the script because they're like confusing the name of the character or they're making suggestions about something that actually does show up later. <clears throat> I, I think my immediate response as a consultant to that is take some deep breaths. <laughs> don't, don't overreact to those types of notes. Be, I, it, it's kind of, coming at this process of, of receiving feedback with an open mind of, I know that I can use any of this to, to improve the, the project. That's mm -hmm. what ultimately the reader is trying to do. And, and if um, I had, a, I, I was thinking about this before and there, I had two thoughts. And of course, I'm only thinking of one that doesn't necessarily match here, but you can't be considering notes on a personal basis meaning they're commenting on you they're not they're specifically mm -hmm. commenting on the project and so once we start taking it personally like oh they they're saying this isn't working therefore they mean i'm not a good writer obviously i'm making some you know leaps here taking some leaps but that isn't what it is i tell my writers all the time that even though there might be one project that just isn't working and we're struggling through it and and we just can't get it right that doesn't mean you, you you're not a good writer. It means the project's difficult. Right. And this is the type of problem that every writer is going to be facing for the rest of their lives. It's like a golfer. It's always a new course. <laughs> and it's the course that's difficult. It isn't necessarily that the golfer isn't any good. That may not be that great of a metaphor, but I, I think it's at least taking it from Golf that. Metaphors I, are always good. I, I don't know if I perfectly answered that question um, in terms of specifically what you asked, but obviously. No, we I think you did. I'm going to go to Jordan now because she's um, down here being quiet. Jordan, <laughs> from your perspective as somebody who gives feedback and receives feedback because you're a writer yourself, will you talk kind of about the same topic of the difference between good feedback versus bad feedback and maybe how you distinguish between the two? Uh, well, it's been, it's been, kind of poked at by everyone here, which is, I think you, one of the critical skills to develop as a writer is 
being able to tell the difference between a note on your version of your story and a note on their version of your story. That's a huge skill. It's very learned, it takes a long time. And it is part of not taking it personally. It is part of getting a number of pieces of feedback about a variety of different projects so that when you get to the point where you're like, that's not my version of the story, it may be another person's version of the story. And to that person, it would be very useful. But for my story, this is not a useful note. That doesn't mean that the reader did it intentionally to harm you or to do anything like that. It just means that they were coming at it from a different perspective. I can give you an example. I wrote a rom-com and um, the note came back, uh, this is funny, as if, that was, as if that was like a slight against the story. They were like, I mean, there's romance and I like that romance, but this is also funny. And I'm like, well, good job. I put rom-com on my form. Like, but to them, they hadn't approached it from that perspective. They've, they had approached it from the perspective of a more traditional romance. And so in between the lines, I was reading notes about how to balance the comedy with the romance. So it felt more satisfying to that type of reader. But if it hadn't applied, if it didn't feel correct for my version of the story, it's not a useful note for me. Um, bad notes, I think are also ones where they're not putting in the effort to tell you why something doesn't quite satisfy. It's, a di it's the difference between saying, I don't like this, or saying, I don't understand why this character makes this choice. That's a very big difference in how that note is uh, directed out, how, how critical, how constructive it actually is. Because then I can go, okay, well, I know why this character made that choice. So how can I make it clear to the reader why this character made that choice? Or maybe it was the wrong choice because it didn't ultimately lead where I wanted it to go. I didn't naturally or, or um, in a grounded way lead to the conclusion I wanted. That's, and like Max said, noticing the difference in how things are phrased, it, it takes time. And you can only really know once you have digested enough feedback to be like, oh, okay. Yeah, can I add to that just a little bit? Because mm -hmm. there are two things there that um, are, they're all really great points, Jordan. I think the, the, there's also the understanding who you're receiving those notes from, because sometimes if you're receiving notes from a coach or a consultant or a contest or someone you hired to give you notes, then paying attention to your personal vision, and this is my version of the story, absolutely essential. If you're receiving notes from a studio executive or a producer on a project and they're going to be making your movie, then you might need to be leaning toward this is their, their version is what they're going to make. So you then have to have a little bit of a leeway there. Okay, I want to try to keep some of my vision in here, but this is also their movie right now. So, you know, there's there's some balance. But then also um, the last part you were mentioning, um, oh, how to kind of to look at a particular note saying, I don't understand this character's choice in this moment, and then trying to read between the lines. That's an art, like you're saying, Jordan, that, that takes time and practice. Uh, the easiest way to look at that is they may not be meaning this choice on page 36 is what needs to change. It is the choices prior to this that then is not making sense for them to make the choice here. That is something that most um, readers or people giving notes won't necessarily say. And that, I think, is the right. hardest part about applying notes. That's a really good point. Yeah, I'm going to go to Jeff really quick, but I'm, yeah. I'm going to touch on that, Max, because what you just said is something we've talked about in ISA Insider News. We've talked about generally if you're in a stuck place or there's an issue with your script, it's you, where the, the place where you think you're stuck, you're not really stuck there. It's something prior to that that you need to go back to. So, yeah, if somebody gives you a note that I'm, I don't understand this choice, it's because what happened before, not that you need to change their choice. You need to make us believe why they would make that choice earlier on. Um, Jeffrey. I wanted to go back to the question of good and bad notes for a second, because mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to hear from a writer after they've received my notes is for them to say two things. First, there were some points I absolutely agreed with. And then there are some points I absolutely disagreed with, because that shows me that the writer 
isn't looking at nodes in terms of good or bad, but they're really just looking at them in terms of utility. Can I use these comments? And can I break up the notes and say, this is the stuff that I'm gonna take with me and this is the stuff I'm gonna to toss aside. And writers should always feel prepared to do that. And this actually ties a little bit into what Max is talking about simply as a skill to develop. Because if you are able to take notes, even notes that are perhaps you receive them and you go, this is a problematic read, but I can sort of glean insights here. I understand where the reader's coming from. Maybe they're from a producer background. And if you're able to do that and engage with those kinds of notes, then when you are talking to a producer or some other type of industry professional and they make a suggestion, it's not simply a matter of, well, I disagree with it, but you're going to make my movie or you know, I'll make the change or I won't. But instead you can go, okay, well, I understand where this producer is coming from. And I understand what I want to do with my script. And can I bridge those two? Or can I re-articulate what I wanted to do in the draft and find some sort of a compromise? And those are the types of skills that you can develop as you engage with different types of readers. Yeah, you know, when I was coming up, um, everybody talked about in glowing terms of a writer named Harlan Ellison, who was a, a brilliant writer, uh, but whose career in television didn't go very far because he did things like throw a model of a submarine at a producer, which he then dined out on that story for the rest of his career about how great he was because he stood up for his script. Um, well, maybe he was, but the show was Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, which like wasn't Shakespeare to begin with. And, and secondly, you know, he didn't work very much because who wants to work with somebody who throws stuff at them? So it's not all about just in, especially in a, a this field, it's not all about just what you want. What you want may be the best thing, it really may be, but it's about getting something done and it's a collaborative process. And I think it's always important to keep that in mind. I think, it, and to add on that point, it's like, don't make everything so precious. You know, if somebody throws a note at you that does seem a little out of left field, it's like, why not explore it a little bit on the side just to get a feel for it? It might help you break through in a way. There's a acting, exercise where you may be you know rehearsing a scene for a drama but then you play it like a horror or you play it like a comedy and you try all different genres in the word the dialogue that you're using you could take that same kind of philosophy in your notes and use the exploration to help you break through or to find the pathway to making it clearer what you're trying to say with your characters good point craig i'm gonna stay with you because i think as somebody who has received feedback and coming from a place of emotion when you when you read feedback let's say you got feedback that you didn't love that you may have thought was completely terrible and oh my god this is the worst feedback i've ever gotten in my whole life how do you personally <clears throat> handle and what do you do like what's your process of getting through that emotional part to a place where you can implement and as we've been talking about reading between the lines of maybe in or poorly articulated notes or something or or something maybe good that you just don't agree with how do you get through that uh first i punched my bed for 45 minutes and i'm very angry at the world because it didn't work whatever i was doing um it's frustrating to get notes and to have, especially when you've written draft after draft after draft and you feel really good about it and then you get this these notes and uh, some of it's going to be encouraging and you're like, oh, great, great. They love it. They love it. They, oh, they don't love it. And they start hammering away. Um, for me personally, I read it and I do get mad. I, it's just a reality and say, and I, I, I get frustrated with it. And then I go sit on it for a while. I just let it sink in and I come back to it uh, a day or whatever amount of time later. And I explore it again. And I do look for the in-between. Like, what is it they're, they're saying? Does it match up with what I'm trying to say? Where am I failing? Um, because it's on me to get the point across. And, and if I'm not getting it across, I have to trust it. I mean, I did pay a service that, you know, ideally you did your research and found a service that you trusted, you've gone to before. Um, but, you know, take, you just, I just try to take it all in. And I just, I'm like, what is it they're trying why is that scene not working or why is the, the uh, you know, this particular character not arcing out the way that I hoped? What can I do? And I really uh, just take time with it and I explore it. And I mean, I have that happening right now where one of the characters is just kind of flatlined through the whole story. And 
I'm like, what is I going to do with the scenes that they're in that I can help show something interesting about who they are to the story, to the character we're engaging with, and how they're going to elevate the story or even themselves change, at least in some sort of way, so the audience doesn't feel like they're just there as a surface character. And, um, and it, it does get frustrating. It 100% does. I've gone through numerous drafts with my writing partner on this one script. And, but this is, you should take it as kind of like an awesome opportunity to explore new things, you know? Um, because what your ultimate goal is, is to sell your project and you're competing against who knows how many amazing writers that are out there. And, uh, and they may have the relationships you don't. The only thing you have is to create a, an incredible screenplay. So wherever you can take in the notes and then sharpen those characters or sharpen whatever notes they're giving, giving to you, play around with it and explore with your writing group and then go back and get more. Um, and I know that gets expensive, but it's, it's an investment in your time. If you can find a group of people who you trust with trust and you can go bounce these ideas back and forth with um, before you go spending any more money, that's great. Find those people tr that you trust. Um, but it is, it is a journey. I, I've been developing right. the script for three years and that is kind of the, the experience you want it to be amazing. That's the thing you have to sell to the world and the story you want to tell. So trust the resources you're going to and try to implement some of them. Sometimes it's going to fail, even as you do. And then that's going to be frustrating, you know? Right. When you start right, again. Let's, get, let's get into two topics that I want to talk about that I don't want to forget because I'll forget. They'll go out my brain. One is conflicting feedback. So let's say that you go out to, you get feedback from three different three different companies say you want to just test the waters and you send it up and you get massively conflicting feedback from those three places. How do you manage that sort of feedback? And is it something that you should do? Should you do feedback one at a time and get those notes and then go out? Or should you share with the world and then get all the feedback at once? Um, Jeffrey, what do you think? Well, if you get conflicting feedback first, I just want to say good job, because that means that you're doing exactly what we're talking about and getting opinions from all over the place. We even have, this is not a service we offer right now, but we have a little system where we will have members of the team give notes and encourage them to go, okay, where do you disagree with, with this other person? And we do that for certain projects internally. So I'm actually a very much an advocate for getting diverse opinions, conflicting feedback, um, what you have to do in that situation is you have to ask yourself first, is there a, an underlying issue here? For example, if someone says, well, the pacing is too fast and you look, okay, well, are they talking about this specific scene? And then someone else says, well, the pacing is too slow. Okay, well, what is actually determining your pacing? For example, if you're talking about a romance, is the progression of the romance moving so that two very different readers would be aligned because of that emotional tug and pull? And if that's not there, then you can work on that. So usually conflicting feedback, it's because you're getting notes on the execution, on the structure. It's very common for conflicting notes to be on structure and things of that mm -hmm. matter, or they're gravitating towards a particular character, but then you should ask, okay, well, there's a divisive character. Is this an instance where how they're being introduced, the main point of view character, how they're engaging with them, it's leaving too much or too little to a reader's interpretation and just as another example for if you give too little of an interpretation, you've, you've boxed the character in, you've said, this is how the character should be received, then someone who disagrees, they're going to disengage with that character, they're going to disengage with the scene and then the script. And so then you want to evaluate in that matter. And so these are all the different ways that you can, you can look at conflicting feedback. And then I would just add the final point, which is, again, to always take a step back and go, okay, well, what do you want to do? Because if you have a script, say, with a message, and you go, no, this character is bad. This is a, a person that needs to be viewed in a negative light. And someone's saying, well, can we round it out? If, again, if it's at your call that you want them viewed in that way, then go, okay, well, I am, you are ultimately writing a script for a group of people, not everyone. So be willing to take that route. I like the answer. Sean, do you want to pipe in there? Yeah, I mean, like Jeff said, first of all, look for things that um, line up. And then you, you generally find your big problems. The other thing to remember is that, you know, everybody's got an opinion. And in the industry, you're going to go to one producer or another. Think about, think about this. Think of how differently Quentin Tarantino would approach a script as opposed to how Wes Anderson would approach the same script. So you're, you're going to get conflicting viewpoints on that. It's your script. It's your decision to make. 
but be honest with yourself about what may or may not be wrong with it. Um, if you're getting conflicting things, I don't know. I think it's kind of good if you press a button, like Jeff said, it's good if you press a bunch of different buttons with people, because that means they're reacting to it. And, um, that's better than um, just apathy. But uh, yeah, try and see how it all comes together. I like that. I like that. I like that if you get a reaction, even if somebody gives you some like negative feedback on something, you've got a reaction. And that's huge to get an emotion out of somebody. I mean, that that's really what it's all about, in my opinion. Um, in, a, in a certain respect, we're all toddlers. So, you know, we just want reactions. Attention. Totally. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of responses, but I don't want to take over. So even if I say this to my writers all the time, so even when you're sitting in the theater watching your movie, like four weeks after it's been released, like not even on opening night, you're going to be sitting there going, oh, that I should have done something that does not work. And then there's going to be about 200,000 other people who are saying, oh, this didn't work. And it's impossible to please everyone. So I think coming into the notes, knowing what your intention is, not only for the story, but for your characters, with your structure, with confidence, like you've made these decisions before you've written the script and you understand why you've made the, the, those uh, decisions. The execution of those decisions is what hopefully you want to receive feedback on. And I have a talkative cat that's decided to join me. Um, that then you allows you to kind of form your brain. Like if somebody comments on, well, this pacing was kind of slow here, you at least can go to a place where you're thinking, well, that's kind of what I was hoping for. If they think it's too slow, all right, maybe I can speed it up a little bit. Or if somebody thinks it's way too fast, you, you might then have to put yourself in the, the seat of that reader and go, well, were they just reading my script too quickly? Or did they not see a moment prior to this that you have to come in with confidence? Um, meaning, I know what my I'm trying to do here. Um, and a lot of times vomit drafts where you're just putting things down in that first draft mode, you don't have all those answers. And you have to be aware of where you are in the development of your project when you're about to give someone your script for them to give you feedback. If it is just first draft vomit, like I don't care, why even give anybody to, <laughs> that script to read it? You can probably find these problems on your own. Um, but that then goes to the other th point that I'm not going to spend too much time on. But um, obviously, my title is director of education, and, and I'm going to harp on everybody needing to educate yourselves. But if you don't understand the principles of character development, conceptual development and brainstorming, how to work through a good idea, how to decide whether or not it's a good idea, how structure works, and just generally speaking, all these other elements, if you don't do that, then you're kind of just fishing as you're going through your script, hoping that you get lucky. <laughs> it's, just, it's rare. It's not going to happen very often. Right. That's what I do. <laughs> you've been um, in this for a while, Shayla. Come on. It's, you know, you've educated. No, I know. Um, okay. So let's talk about, let's say that you're somebody who has never gone for feedback, who's never paid for feedback, never gone to a service. If you're somebody, let's say you have you're on your third screenplay, okay? And at this point you're like, okay, I feel like it's good enough. I'm gonna send it out for feedback. What type of feedback do you think that somebody who's a new person, a new feedback getter should do? Um, should they go for what we have, which is like a development evaluation, a marketing evaluation, or should they maybe dip their toe in the water and go for something small and kind of like receive those notes. Is there a is there a path that maybe a new a new not a new writer but somebody who's a first time feedback getter? I don't what's a word for that? I don't know receiver whatever. <laughs> um, is there a path that maybe is a good path to take? I'm assuming that one's over on over for me. Uh, yeah, I, sure. I would recommend the uh, the full evaluation specifically because it's a complete read of the screenplay and it's two pages. The deep dive can also be useful. However, if you're completely new to feedback, it's going to be a bit of a process because you're not just going to be absorbing the reader's opinions. There's going to be sort of assumptions that you thought were in your script. And now you're hearing that maybe they weren't in the draft. They were 
perhaps even an earlier draft and things changed, or, you know, you might have implied things in sort of your vision of the scene that just weren't on the page. And so those two pages of notes, they're very focused, and that is a, a good place to start engaging. So I would recommend starting there. Um, the first 20 can also be useful because those tend to focus a little bit more on the structure and honing in on specific dialogue. So if you have perhaps issues of setup or exposition or just general craft elements that need to be worked on, those can be caught in the first 20. So I would go for those two. Well, so Jordan, I'll, I'll ask you, what, what do you write more than any of us in this room, which makes me envious, um, but also inspired? <laughs> I, I, don't, um, what I do you, don't know that that's necessarily true. Okay, all right. <laughs> Jordan seems like she's always working on something, which I love to hear. Um, what do you do after your first draft? Uh, well, I've gotten to the point now where I want brutal notes. I want mm -hmm. brutal notes. I think you have to, uh, personally, I went through a phase of being very precious with my own material. And then I realized that a constructive no is a thousand times more valuable than a flattering yes. Um, mm -hmm. And it's so valuable that like, if you, I mean, I'm not going to name any names because I would love to work for these people one day, but if you watch the films of certain directors, once they reach a certain level or certain filmmakers, once they reach a certain level, you start to notice that there's, their movies aren't as visceral, aren't as like biting, specific, exciting, voicey as they once were because no one's saying no to them anymore. Mm. And that is something that if you're lucky enough to have a group of friends that you really trust their opinion, that they are good writers, that they, will, they genuinely care about you and wanna give you feedback, that's wonderful. But if you're not, it's often very useful to just kind of let people be brutal on that project so that you can go away for a while. And when there is no emotion attached to it any longer, you can return to those notes and go, all right, now I'm going to lay them out. I'm going to write out the similarities, the differences. Which ones do I agree with? Which ones don't I agree with? And why don't I agree with them? Um, and I, um, you know what Craig said about um, exploring things in a way you wouldn't have before, that becomes also part of the process because in all honesty, I don't know about you, but sometimes I finish a script and I genuinely didn't think about the theme throughout. I just was like, this is a fun idea. I love this character. I wanna see how they explore this theme. And then you get to the end and you're like, oh yeah, what am I actually trying to say here? <laughs> Maybe I need to focus on. And you get the, used to it. The more you do it, it's a lot like one of the last comment here by Gonzalo saying after he finishes the draft and then you, you move on to something else, um, preferably <laughs> you start writing something else. Um, but Jeffrey, you had your hand up. Well, I was actually about to call out that comment because it's, it's like, that is a great thing to do. Um, but I did also wanted to talk a little bit about tone if I could, um, because mm -hmm. you're talking about brutal notes. Um, I also saw earlier, some people were asking about the difference between compassionate notes versus constructive notes. I also saw some comments in there about asking the writer, well, did you find it interesting? And uh, I've also been asked myself, well, is my writing good? And they just want a strict yes or no answer. And the answer to that is often far more complex because it talks about different tiers of writing and how you're developing and how dense your writing is and how dense this draft is versus your other writing and how close it aligns with what you're doing. So uh, we actually have guidelines on tone for our notes. Um, and they're the same tone, uh, tonal guidelines that I apply to myself, which is I want notes to be clinical. And so mm -hmm. if you get the notes, you'll find that it's not a matter of being compassionate versus being constructive. Hopefully they're always constructive and they're a careful analysis of your vision. And the compassion really does come from before the notes are written. The compassion comes from, if you're if someone is on this call, on our ISA team, on our reading team, it's because they really do have a commitment to help writers. And so that compassion, that's where the compassion is. Once we enter the notes, we want to adapt a different form of language, a different attitude, and that's all to help the writer. Um, and I, I actually wanna bring up a little something that Craig mentioned is that how he's gotten notes that can be very positive, very glowing. And, there is a way to write notes that's safe. 
there's a way to write it where you don't really give specifics because that's another thing that has been mentioned because, well, what if you're wrong? You, you say, well, this thing happened on this page and then actually it happened a couple pages earlier. Um, and then you throw in the authority of the notes into question. So some readers are come to us and they apply and they write in that manner. It's safe, it's always positive and it's broad. And those writers don't get on um, because those kinds of notes are ultimately not helpful. So I would, you know, hopefully we don't send out harsh notes or toxic or brutal or anything like that, but we do try to send out challenging notes. The phrase we're always using on our team is actionable criticism. And so we want to make sure that whatever we're saying, there's something you can do with it. And so that, that is how I would approach notes from a tonal perspective, both as someone who's directing the note construction, but also just as someone who knows a lot of writers who are receiving these notes. I love that because it's kind of this idea of like, if you go into the process of, of about to receive notes, you receive notes and you're going into it thinking, I can't wait to hear what they liked about it. You're not preparing yourself for what you actually need to change. Right. It's, it's, it's just like dating or being in a relationship. If you go in to start dating someone thinking you're perfect, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> You're in for a rude awakening. What? And, you know, and how boring would it be if you were with someone that was constantly saying, yes, yes, you're amazing, perfect, it's great. Sounds if, good to me. Yeah, see, and I knew no that comments. joke would come up, but really. <laughs> Jeffrey says that to me every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. But yeah, you, you should be expecting not to hear praise. Go to your friends for the praise. Get feedback for the actual actionable criticism that you're going to get how do you make um, it better somebody asked me a question the other day is like how many phenomenal we read a lot of screenplays obviously how many phenomenal screenplays do you get and uh out of twenty thousand, i said oh 20 i mean it's hard to say that anything's Maybe. ever going to be phenomenal right yeah. because it is so subjective people different producers um all of us on this call can recognize great writing for sure right but when you say phenomenal, what is the question you're asking? Was it really well crafted? Great. Is it producible? Okay, cool. Um, does does every every aspect of it work? There's there's probably never really ever been a perfectly written screenplay, but a movie has turned into something that could be close to perfect for you or for anyone. Um, so it's not to, about. I mean, again, back to the whole precious thing and being making sure that you are utilizing notes to be to get your point across, your vision across, and to make sure that you're selling that. Uh, and then you'll eventually find the right company, but you, you don't wanna be going to a company who, um, or a reader who's constantly just churning out, yes, you're amazingly talented, because you could mm -hmm. be amazingly talented, but is the script producible, right? Is, is yeah. the story working? Are the characters arcing out? Is it entertaining? Can the producers make money? You know, right. It may That's just really be a good it sample. It could just be a good sample of your craft that you can get into a writer's room. So there's all sorts of ways to kind of interpret the notes and or a project that you're working on, because I can say this and I know everybody here who's a writer can say the same thing is that it's very personal when you're writing a screenplay. And that's why I, punch, I don't really punch my bed, but it's like if the 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 feeling of it when somebody comes back and criticizes it. But if you go into it with the intention, I want somebody to tell me where I'm not making this script phenomenal. How have I not gotten it to phenomenal, you know? Right. Um, a question keeps popping up. We're gonna jump into the Q&A questions because we're gonna wrap this up in the next 15 minutes. Um, but one keeps popping up in the chat and I want everyone to feel free on this panel to, if you've seen something in the chat, that's that we haven't addressed yet get there but Sean can you address I think you mentioned that you would talk about it a little bit um, about genre specific should you be going to a company or or someone who is familiar with the genre so let's say you're a horror writer and you are looking for feedback on your horror script what's the best route to go should you go genre specific or should you go general I'm or thinking both. back to when I was first starting out and I remember talking to uh, uh, someone who was a showrunner and, and sort of mentored me and they, they said, um, 
you know, write this kind of stuff. But if you want to write that and specifically you're talking about Star Trek, Star Trek is its own thing. And mm -hmm. the rest, the rest of the industry doesn't, you know, that's not going to be a good sample for the rest of the industry. So there are ifs, like things like the horror genre is such a genre unto itself that yes, you can go to somebody horror specific. Um, but it also, I mean, in my opinion, and once again, I, I've been wrong, um, it should work as a script and, and anybody should be able to give you notes on it uh, and notes that are helpful. I, I question genre specific stuff. I wouldn't know who you would go to because to, to me, that sort of seems more like a, a marketing ploy and I'll mm -hmm. look at your science fiction script or I'll look at your horror script um, as opposed, just as opposed to I'll, I'll work, I'll work on your script. But yeah, there are things that are specific things unto themselves that don't really, uh, translate into other things. So I hope that's helpful. Jeffrey. Um, well, I want to talk about two things uh, specifically for genres. Um, we do sometimes, you know, I read over all the notes and if I see that a reader hasn't engaged with something that perhaps this was a horror genre and they don't seem articulate enough, those notes don't go out, those get reassigned. And mm. I do sometimes, or I'll send it back to the reader and I'll say, well, you might not find it interesting, but you have to find a way, you have to find the interest, you have to imagine yourself as the audience. And so this is something we take quite seriously. Uh, it doesn't matter what your genre is. It is a genre that deserves good writing. And as a writer of that genre, you deserve respect and you deserve, you deserve strong commentary. Uh, but it goes beyond just genre. It also is something that impacts people who are, say, people of color, and they're writing from their experiences, or people who are female writers or writers across the gender spectrum, as well as general LGBTQIA plus writers. A lot of these writers are coming in and they're telling stories, they're telling new stories. They're talking about communities that are underrepresented and they aren't simply underrepresented in terms of the material that's out there, but the very infrastructure of Hollywood is behind in all regards. And so there needs to be someone who says, okay, well, is someone going to read my script that's going to understand where I'm coming from? And we try to do that. And it's not simply a matter of, fortunately our reading team is the biggest it's ever been and it has more representation than it's ever had, but we could have 10 times the size and it wouldn't reflect the diversity of writers that we see every day as we go through contests, we go through gig submissions. So it's a matter of finding if you can find writing groups, but then you can find services and understand, okay, well, did this person really understand my story, my experiences? And as we've been talking about throughout this call, bridging that gap as the writer and as you're receiving that criticism. So um, this is a very, again, just a very important topic. We can go on for days about this specific element. But you're not going to. <laughs> but I, 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 I can tell when people are like, okay, Jeff. But, but Shane is not going to let us. Uh, no, <laughs> there's a mute, there's a mute button and I think my chair will fall through the floor. So. <laughs> yes, I have a trap door set for each of you. And when you don't comply with what I want, I will drop you down. Um, is there anything that any of you on the panel saw in the chat or topics that we didn't get to that you want to touch on before we wrap it up? Max, is there any final words? Mention there? about uh, submitting right. the competitions and getting feedback there. Um, it's kind of goes along with the uh, the submitting to multiple places. One of the lessons I learned having submitted to contests in the past is, uh, you know, you get excited about a draft that you've completed, you're like, you've done all that you needed to do. Um, at least you think you have, you, you submitted to different uh, readers, a couple here and there. Um, I would still be very cautious about, A, there's, you know, contests are different than just general uh, feedback from organizations who are looking to find producible screenplays. It's, it's a different world. That's something you should know. But if you're gonna use contests to get feedback, which I have done in the past, is take one draft and submit it to three different competitions and, um, and, and look for what we talked about before, some of the commonalities, something that, you know, some of the things that resonate that others aren't saying, um, some of the, um, just like some random, uh, ideas that will help you along, but don't submit to 10 contest contests all at the same time, spend $800 and, and then you get the first set of notes back. This is a lesson I've learned. Having spent $800, I got the first set of notes back and I'm like, holy shit, 
I didn't even see it. And no, I know mm -hmm. I'm not going to place in any of these contests. I know it. I just wasted $750 beyond the getting the notes from the first one. So be very careful of that. Um, we're excited about something. It means, you know, when you write something, it's like I said, it's very important. It's personal. It's precious. But be very careful with it as well. And if you're going out to three different companies that you trust, contests that you regard, rate, pay for feedback before you spend an extra whatever amount of money to just get into the contests so that you can see how uh, you can benefit, um, uh, advance your and elevate your screenplay. I Those awards do matter. They do have value in the, in the world of producers' minds. Again, there is a difference, sir, next. There's a difference between winning a contest and get, having a producible uh, ready script. But there is a good gauge you can use there to see where you are in the industry. It's, it's a good segue to Emily's uh, comment that she yes. sent just to the host and panelists. And then Lindy saying, I had no idea, was it that expensive? And then Jennifer, that's really good advice just to apply just to one. Um, for one thing, I'll, I'll just quickly try to reply to Emily's. She asked, how do you tell when a script is ready to approach contests? And I think I don't think there is a right answer, a perfect answer. Well, I think to she's thing. saying when are when you get feedback, when you keep getting feedback, because you're always going to get feedback. If you go out, you're going to get feedback. She's saying when is it ready to approach contacts, like For producers sure. or somebody's ready? I think you said contests when you. Oh saying, my so bad. Yeah, approach contacts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there, can I say one comment about that? Because sure. uh, there is a good gauge. You they start talking about your budget. They don't talk about constructive notes. And your characters and the, and how they're arcing a theme or whatever they just start talking about you could feel them fishing for to give you mm -hmm. notes because they have to give you something so it's there's there may be other things beyond budget but that's one that i've been noticing lately is budget pops up this is a really expensive movie and you know but you're not really talking about helping me uh, improve the story you're talking about from a producer perspective and that's not what i'm paying yeah. for yeah I think, and this is a kind of a controversial <laughs> opinion, I'll admit. Um, I am of the mind that a great idea is going to usually, try not to use a particular word, um, outshine um, great writing. In From a mainstream standpoint, I, so I, there are a whole bunch of caveats you can make to that statement. So I would say if you if you know after receiving a bunch of notes that the idea is really solid and it has a great hook or it's sellable in some form, et cetera, and you've worked enough on the execution of it where you feel exhausted of, of ideas, you're like, I, I don't know how much more I can bring to this, but I'm getting feedback on the concept being really pretty strong. Let's now try to get it to people that could be then considering it as opposed to just giving notes. I think that would be my best best answer to Emily. But then as far as what Lindy's mentioning, um, submitting to contests can be very expensive. I mean, you know, as Craig's mentioning $750. He's probably including that all the feedback that he also purchased above just the cost of the contest. Um, but, you know, for contests, 50 bucks a crack without getting feedback, even that's a couple hundred dollars. So it it is important to not just write one draft, go, great, let's use the contests to judge whether or not this is ready because mm -hmm. there's a really good chance, especially if you go into a big contest like Nickel and Page and Blue Cat and Austin and these contests that get 15,000 entries. And if you're entering your first draft, I'm sorry to say it, I'll be just be blunt, you wasted your money. Right. You wasted money. Um, so don't do that. <laughs> don't waste your money. <laughs> Yeah, use the smaller competitions to get and pay for feedback, or just go straight to a feedback service. Yeah, and and spend the money hundred percent on that. Just well, I notice. think that's that's a good thing just to touch on really quick. Is I feel like a lot of people believe that if they get feedback from a contest, it means that they're maybe at a higher, maybe they have more of a chance of getting to the next round. As if that's like a caveat, like you get this little bonus if you're buying feedback. That's not necessarily true. At least for us, it's not right. Jeff, who do, when you order feedback, if you enter an ISA con contest and you order feedback, those are two different people, right? Yes. They're two completely separate people. Anytime you submit to the ISA, 
we will assign it to a different reader unless you specifically request it. Um, you can actually contact me at submissions at network ISA, not for contest uh, judging, but for feedback, if you want a little bit more insight about the readers or something like that, because we do sometimes for feedback, make special accommodations. Um, but uh, no, yeah, they're, they're completely separate. And I, I think that's a big enough. reason why I just want to add is because we do not want to create a pay to win system. Yeah, this is something that comes straight from Craig, so I get to brag about is, is that he does not want to create a system where someone has can just throw money and create these kinds of opportunities. That's why we talked about the feedback tiers, because we don't want you spending this amount of money if you haven't experimented with this contest, this feedback. Um, at the same time, we also don't want people to order 17 of one type of feedback and go, okay, wait a minute, now you need to think about where you're spending your money. Um, because just yesterday, we were actually talking about an article that was about how there is this burden on people who have lower income who are trying to break into the industry and it's a real thing and it's a thing that we're trying to address okay um all right so we're going to wrap this up now so let's go around to each person and give <clears throat> final thoughts anything that you didn't we didn't cover that you want to just touch on um sean let's start with you uh i think feedback is useful i mean i use for myself i use Paid services. I also use people that I've worked with previously to look at drafts. I don't think anybody can live in a bubble and expect to move forward. And think about it as networking. You know, you're going out and you're getting other people to look at your work. Take it with everything with a grain of salt. You know your script better than everybody else, but you know, there's 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 reasons why different people have different opinions, but don't be afraid to reach higher. Great, thank you. And thank you for being here. Um, Jordan. Um, yes, feedback is very important. Critical, um, if you want to be, you know, if what you really want is to just keep growing and evolving your craft and becoming a better and better writer over time. I do think it's, it's potentially very useful to kind of look at feedback as an ongoing process, even into production. Because if you think about it that way, you're still going to receive feedback from producers, from executives, from the director, from the lighting guy, um, way into production of your script. And as long as you keep that in mind that the thing that matters is your vision for the project and seeing your story come to life, it, make, it puts all notes in perspective. The goal is ultimately to let your script be the blueprint for a final project that you can be really proud of and so excited to share. And in that, from that perspective, notes will come in in various forms throughout the process. And so don't be afraid of them. Don't be, don't look at it as like a process that eventually ends. It really only ends when the movie's out. And, and that's okay. That's a kind of the, the collaborative process of the industry. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Max. Um, I will say that um, I'd probably just be repeating myself. I guess I'll, I'll kind of go backwards a little bit and, and talk about something a little different than just feedback. I think if you can really do the upfront work to test your concept, whatever, when you first get the idea, is this something that not only I'm excited about writing and spending the next six to 12 months writing it at least. Um, but also, is it an easy to digest idea? Is that even if it's incredibly detailed, like I wrote a young adult fantasy adventure novel that the world is ridiculously large, probably too big. And it might be why it turns people off. But I had to distill it down to what's the basic idea here? Because it's the only way people are going to get on the same page with me. So I don't care if it's this, you know, kind of um, the purge, huge hook specific genre, or if it's the sweeping epic period piece melodrama, <laughs> you know, it, every single idea has some form of a hook. If you can figure out what that is, then you're not getting comments in your feedback about the idea, because that can be difficult. You do all this work to try to execute what you think is, is a good idea. And then people are going, well, the concept isn't, you're not really matching this or that too quickly, and I say this, I think on almost every single recording I make, which is a lot, 
we so quickly as writers want to get into interior greasy spoon night and then the the visuals and the cool fun dialogue and the the great you know visual representations of theme because we're artists at heart stop doing that please spend the time doing the upfront work before you get to the pages to see if this is worthwhile mm. once you absolutely know yes i know all the elements of this and 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 why it's important to me and how my voice is going to shine why am why am i the person who's going to be uh you know the right one to write this then you get into writing it. Now your feedback is actually going to be more constructive because now I have to figure out how to execute the idea that I know is already strong. So I think that's what I would want to share. Make sure that you're you're doing the upfront work. Feedback is necessary. I think it's absolutely necessary for mm -hmm. wherever you are at the level of your, your craft. Um, but you need to spend time on the craft. Right. Yeah. Good point. Um, Jeffrey. Uh, well, I wanted to just say first, thank you to the people who are watching live as well as the people who are watching the replay. And I also want to say that if you are here, I want you to know that you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. it means you're seeking information. You're finding different opportunities, different options for yourself. And so you can rest assured that just by being here and by listening, you're actually getting a leg up. And so I encourage you to continue that journey because as Jordan alluded to, it is a process that's going to continue all the way, not just through your project's lifespan, getting to the end of the feature, but in your life as you grow as a writer. And so I just want to thank everyone here for letting us help you on that journey. Oh, that was so nice. Craig, you're gonna yeah, round I mean, this out I'm, almost. Oh boy, uh, everybody has said some amazing things and uh, it just goes back for me to just enjoy the process. Um, you know, they say, enjoy the journey, not the destination. You want to write a great screenplay. We all, we all do. Um, but enjoy, enjoy the process. Is If you're a writer, you're going to be writing every day for the rest of your life and ideally getting paid to do it. Um, so enjoy it. Enjoy getting those back because at, uh, at, at every level as you go and advance in your career, you're going to get notes from executives. You're going to have to take those in you might as well learn how to do it right now, you know, because they're going to they're gonna guide you a certain way. And if they're paying for it, it's a paid gig. You got to do it. There's going to be some passion projects you're going to love. And uh, you, you have to tell them the way you have to tell them. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But listen, take in the notes, absorb them, spend some time contemplating them. And you'll know in your heart if those notes apply to the story you're trying to tell, or if it just Somehow I didn't connect what I'm trying to say. So I'll, I'll just, I'll stick with what I'm trying to say and I'll just form it slightly differently or try something different. You don't have to rewrite your whole screenplay necessarily, but sometimes you do. And you gotta be prepared for that too, but enjoy again, enjoy the process because you're a writer and the, there's nothing more rewarding than to me. I, I remember the first film I ever had uh, uh, screened you know, I wrote a screenplay and convinced people to, to help me shoot it. And then we four walled it. So no one was paying for it except me and my friends. And um, uh, just having completed the process, we never sold it, but completing and having the story, even if there was one person in the room, it would have been enough to just have somebody connect to the story, see my story uh, and experience it with me. It was so rewarding. And, uh, and I think, you know, if you can get to a place where you get uh, your script coming back with there's budgetary concerns, you know, then it's a good sign. Um, but again, just enjoy the process and have, have fun trying to um, improve upon what you're doing, what you're writing. And I will wrap it up since I'm the moderator on this. Um, from my perspective, getting any sort of feedback is absolutely terrifying. It's terrifying from your friends. It's terrifying from strangers. It's just terrifying because you, as writers, we want it to be perfect. We want it to work. We want it to be great. And when it's not, you have to take it inside and go, oh God, now, and it's only on you to fix it. So if you're scared, that is good. Go forward. You've been scared before and you've written it on the page. You put it on the page. So go get the feedback, do the work keep going, never stop, and, and try to enjoy the process as much as you can, except for that first moment you get the feedback. Then you can just rage inside, whatever you need to do. <laughs> From all of us at ISA, 
thank you. As Jeffrey said, thank you for joining us today and watching this and continuing your career. Check out that Craig feedback to... tab on our page if you want to order feedback from any of the amazing people on our team here. Yeah, there yes. was a question about how much should feedback cost. You'll see a nice range on, on the ISA site. Excellent. All right. Have a great day, everybody. See you later. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.